The 10th of November, 1944. The USS Mount Hood was moored almost dead center in Sea Adler Harbor, next to the Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. Supplying vital ammunition to nearby ships, this vessel was filling an important role for the Navy in its war efforts. But in a flash, the vessel would become the second worst base disaster in the Pacific, second only to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Laid out as the SS Marco Polo on the 28th of September 1943, she would be launched and commissioned as the USS Mount Hood AE-11 with the US Navy on the 1st of July 1944. She was built in the North Carolina Shipbuilding Company yards, but under the US Maritime Commission contract. The vessel would be built and used in the US military before being sold back to private entities after the war. Mount Hood was a Type C2 freighter, but was built as an ammunition handling ship, the first in her class. She was an impressive 13,910 tons and could carry a whopping 7,700 tons fully loaded. She was 459 feet long and 63 feet at the beam. Her geared turbine engine connected to one shaft and pushed her along at 16 knots, and she had a complement of 267 men. On the 5th of August 1944, she pulled into the Norfolk Navy Yards in Virginia, unloading 4,000 tons of ammunition. Everything from rockets, 250-pound bombs, small arms ammo, aerial depth charges, and massive 14-inch battleship shells. Her five cargo holds were packed to the gills with every sort of explosive, propellant, and accelerant in the U.S. Navy's arsenal, in preparation for the invasion of Japan. She transited the Panama Canal as part of Task Group 29.6 on the 21st of August, before steaming for Papua New Guinea. She arrived on the 22nd of September. By this time, the war in the Pacific was at a fevered pitch. The Empire of Japan was on the back foot, but was holding on to land with fervency. Every battle was hard fought and drenched with either side's blood. Seattler Harbor was a frequently used forward operating base, where numerous ships would moor for refit and reloading. The USS Mount Hood had her work cut out for her, as a small fleet of LCMs would surround her every day, frantically loading on supplies to ferry back to their respective vessels. The harbor master determined it beneficial for the expedient outflow of supplies to move her to berth 380, a more centralized part of the harbor for easier access. For a few months, operations went off without a hitch, and business went on as usual. On the 10th of November, the crowded harbor, which could see as many as 400 Navy vessels crammed into it at once, was less so populated, with maybe around 100 or so. Operations started off early that morning, as nearly a dozen LCMs had tied off alongside the ship to begin loading ammunition. A small group of about 18 Mount Hood sailors had gone to shore on Manas to do various things such as collect mail, gather store, go to dentist's appointments, see the base chaplain, and two men were actually being transferred to the base brig to await trial by court-martial. At 8.55, Lieutenant Lester H. Wallace and a handful of men were walking down the beach some 4,600 yards from Mount Hood when a massive shockwave knocked them off their feet. He quickly stood up to look seaward, where his ship once sat was only a massive column of smoke. Mustering his men, they attempted to return to the ship, but found only debris. About 1,100 yards away, the 1024 cargo ship USS Argonne sat in berth 14. Her captain, Commander T.H. Escott, was on deck when the explosion occurred. His account was as follows. At the time of the explosion, I was standing outside my cabin, in conversation with the executive officer. By the time we had recovered our stance from the force of the explosion and faced outboard, the area in the vicinity of Berth 380, where USS Mount Hood had laid moored, was completely shrouded in a pall of dense black smoke. It was not possible to see anything worth reporting. A second or so thereafter, fragments of steel and shrapnel began falling on and around this ship. Some 221 pieces of debris, ranging in size from 1 to 150 pounds, were recovered on board totaling 1,300 pounds. Several other pieces caromed off USS Argonne's port side, into the water alongside, and others landed on YF-681, Freighter Lighter 681, and YO-77, Oil Barge 77, the latter alongside delivering fuel at the time. USS Midnow, ARG-3, Internal Combustion Engine Repair Ship 3, suffered heavily. Moored in a berth between the disintegrating ammunition ship and USS Argonne, Riddled with shrapnel, USS Midnow suffered 23 killed and 174 wounded in the explosion. USS Argonne suffered casualties too, as well as the destruction of a 12-inch searchlight, five transmitting antennas broken away, 
and steam, freshwater, and saltwater lines rupturing, as well as extensive damage from concussion. The USS Midnow was moored extremely close to the Mount Hood, about 350 yards away. She was fully broadside to the exploding ship. When it went up, massive amounts of shrapnel hit the vessel like a cannon broadside from a galleon. The casualties were massive, 180 killed or wounded, 82 dead. 16-year-old David Greenroos was aboard at the time, and gives a chilling account. Our last anchorage was Sea Adler Harbor in the Admiralty Islands, not too far from New Guinea. This was one of the world's largest natural harbors. I once counted 400 large ships, cruisers, battleships, freighters, troop ships, etc., that were anchored briefly in the harbor, preparing for the invasion of Japan. The harbor was relatively empty when the Mount Hood blew up. If it had blown up while the harbor was crowded, the death toll could have been 10 or 20,000 or more. Many times my buddies and I would look over at the Mount Hood, and we could discern that it flew the ammunition flag with the E on it. In fact, we called it the E-11. We often remarked to each other that the ship was illegally parked, according to Navy regulations, because an ammunition ship is supposed to be anchored thousands of yards away from other ships. We often felt very uneasy because it was there week after week. On the morning of the explosion, I had started work early with a new helper who had been assigned to me. His name was Italo Scortaccini, an Italian kid from New York, I think. There were six minesweepers tied alongside our ship for routine maintenance and repairs. I was on the outermost of those minesweepers, and Italo was holding a heavy piece of metal for me to weld onto a damaged railing of this minesweeper. When the blast happened, I was temporarily knocked unconscious for a second or two. I know it was very brief because debris hadn't started falling from the sky yet. The blast was so strong that it blew off most of my clothes, except my underwear, including my shoes. The first thing that I saw was half of Italo's body on one side of the deck and the other half on the other side. It could have been the sheet of metal that he was holding for me that cut him in half. When I got to my feet, the captain of the minesweeper came out of his cabin and was looking towards my ship, and a flying piece of metal steel came through the air and impaled him like a spear to the cabin wall. It was in the center of his chest, and he gasped a little bit and then seemed to die. Debris began to fall from the sky at this time. A large artillery shell fell on the deck, right at my feet, just as a crew member of the minesweeper came up from below. All of the minesweepers were made out of wood, so as not to attract magnetic mines as the ship went about its work clearing minefields. The shell didn't penetrate the heavy wooden deck of the minesweeper, and just lay there at our feet. I looked at him and he looked at me. He asked, should we run? I said, nobody can run that fast if it blows up. Let's throw it overboard. And that's exactly what we did, expecting to be blown to bits at any second. Meanwhile, he said that there were dead men below. The ship had split open, and we were starting to sink. There were dead and dying and drowning people all around us at this point. The port was quickly overwhelmed with the massive amounts of casualties. Men scrambled to search for survivors and provide medical assistance to the wounded. D.D. Haverly and 30 others were torpedo men aboard USS Rainier, waiting to go ashore. He recounts being pressed into recovery efforts. I was coming up the ladder from below decks when a tremendous blast threw me against the bulkhead and partially down the ladder. My first thought was that we had been hit by a torpedo. Got topside in a matter of two or three seconds just in time to see the initial smoke and flames of Hood's explosion. I was mesmerized by what I saw next. The column of smoke rose straight up and mushroomed at the top, a complete preview of how the A-bomb looked a year later. Within one or two minutes, a terrific wave rocked the ship. As I watched the mushroom cloud, I became instantly aware of large and small objects falling from the sky, landing in the water, some very close to us. I can't speak for the thoughts of the skipper of our ship, but suspect that he felt the harbor was under attack, wanted to get the hell out of there, and wanted to dump us 30 torpedo men ASAP. We were ferried to shore at once. About the time we got to shore, the first small craft with casualties started to come in. I don't recall if it was raining, but do recall that there was red mud everywhere. The utter chaos was a scene from hell. Initially, I thought it was because the 30 of us were ammo savvy. That was the reason we were immediately pressed into service. The reality was that we were 30 strong backs that were badly needed. As the various types of small craft arrived at the beach for the next few hours, it was our job to carry the individual metal litters up from the beach to the growing line of ambulances. Each litter held a body, or parts of a body, as we got near the first ambulance, a corpsman checked each litter. 
quickly determined the ones that held a live body, uh, those were taken to the next waiting ambulance. The corpsman would say, he's dead over there or in the ambulance. Those that were dead or contained only body parts were laid out three abreast. And soon piles were made with three litters laid crosswise and three high. After a few hours in the tropic heat, someone initially decreed that a bulldozer should dig a deep and long trench for burial purposes. Basically one big mass grave. And the bulldozing began. It was at this point a chaplain, I don't know his name or denomination, stepped in. And with God-given fury, he stopped the concept of a mass grave and demanded individual graves for each and every body. He prevailed and there were a number of Japanese prisoners of war on the island who were forced to dig the individual graves. All I could think when I heard that was great, how appropriate. The explosion was devastating, to say the least. Over 3,000 tons of ammunition was detonated at once. The resulting report was made by Commander Chester Guile. Conversations must have been choked off in mid-word. Gestures interrupted in mid-air. Thoughts ended at midpoint. One moment, she was a ship teeming with life, humming with activity. Seconds later, she was a vast, black, billowing buyer, which momentarily marked the spot where 350 U.S. Navy men perished without a trace. Mount Hood was anchored in approximately 35 feet of water. The force of the explosion blasted a trench in the harbor bottom, reported by divers as 1,000 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 85 feet maximum depth. In the trench was found the largest piece of the ship's hull, a piece less than 100 feet in its longest dimension. Destruction was complete. Nothing was found after the explosion except fragments of metal which struck other ships. There were no bits of human remains, no supplies of any kind, nothing that had been made out of wood or paper with the single exception of a few tattered pieces of a single notebook floating on the water several hundred yards away. The flying fragments from Mount Hood smashed into some 30 other ships and harbor craft, bringing the total casualties to nearly a thousand killed or wounded. Some of the harbor craft simply vanished with all hands. For some reason, Mount Hood had been anchored in the midst of the ships of the 7th Fleet Service Force. Casualties to other ships would have been minimized if the ammunition ship had been spotted at an isolated location a few miles down harbor off the ammunition supply depot at Lugos, the customary anchorage for ships of that type. Somebody was at fault for designating an anchorage for Mount Hood so near to the other ships. Of the 350 men on board, no remains were found. Their deaths would be mercifully instantaneous, being vaporized in a fraction of a second. All the men were listed as MIA, seeing as none could be identified to be listed as dead. The ship was all but obliterated, the largest section being a 10 foot by 16 foot section of the hull embedded in the seafloor beneath where the ship once sat. An inquiry was launched in an investigation of the cause of destruction of the vessel. No definitive cause was ever determined, but several glaring deficiencies were brought to light. An overall lack of discipline and absence of leadership was noted in the crew, leading to a more lackadaisical atmosphere aboard the vessel. Improper stowage practices were noted in abundance. Things such as boosters, fuses, and detonators were all stowed together in the number one hold. In the number two hold were a number of damaged rockets. Their propellant could be seen spilling out of their damaged casing. Near the number three and four hatch, a number of napalm, pyrotechnics, and gel incendiaries were stowed under a wood and tar paper hut on the deck, very close to the noted ignition point. It was noted that proper handling techniques were not well taught, and certain required handling notices were not posted. Also was the lack of enforcement of non-smoking areas around the ship. Observed before the blast was a small explosion that reached mast height on the ship, just moments before the second massive explosion. Whether this was a bomb improperly being handled, or a spark in a hold igniting a propellant will likely never be known. But the infamous Admiral Nimitz had this to say after reviewing the official report. It is of the opinion of the Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Pacific Fleet, that the question of negligence is not involved, but rather that the technical mistakes by the above-named officers, which are redacted, were errors in judgment, resulting from a keen desire to meet necessary military commitments and move on with the progress of the war. The exigencies of war will always require the acceptance of certain operational hazards. The USS Mount Hood had served only just four months in the US Navy before being blown to smithereens in a fraction of a second. Of the 267 men aboard, only the men of the shore party and one or two on neighboring ships survived. The two men who were up for court-martial were pardoned in light of the trauma that they suffered due to the horrific accident.